Let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians. We're carrying right along. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we will uh, go down through verse 12. Verse 1 through 12, covering a significant part of the second chapter of Thessalonians this morning. So I know that is probably, uh, that's a good amount of reading, so I will read that for us, and, and then we will look into uh, the exposition of the Word of God. This is the Word of the Lord. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with the priest. pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Let's take a moment and pray. God, my prayer is that you would be kind to your people today by speaking your word to them. I am the chosen vessel in your providence, but only the vessel. Please don't let me get in the way of you speaking to your people. And we pray it in Christ's name. The church says amen. Amen. I do like I think a lot of other, or I just suppose that a lot of other uh, ministers do. And I, from time to time, just reflect on my time in in ministry. I don't know what often, often I don't know what provokes that. I just do that sometimes. And I... In my reflections, I ask myself things like, have I been faithful or have I been obedient to the Lord and to the call of ministry? Uh, I wonder if I've been a good example to the people to whom I've ministered. And sometimes that's a a big one for me because I like to cut up a lot. Uh, I wonder sometimes, have I disqualified myself in any way? Have I disqualified myself? And am I just going through the motions only to realize that I've made a career out of something when I really wasn't qualified to to do it because of something I'd done in, in, in the past? And I will acknowledge that these may be noble questions, but I will also say that I ask myself things like, have I been successful? Have I made an impact? Does anybody care or will anybody remember the things that that I've done in ministry? What will other people, even what will other ministry leaders think of my ministry? Will they think that I'm worth my salt? Will they think that I was good or at least passable? And... I I realize that these may be valid questions, but I also admit that they're probably not as noble as as the first set of questions. But noble or no, here's the thing. I think this is a common thing. Most people who are involved in any kind of ministry, whether it's work a day, routine, evangelism and discipleship, or full time pulpit ministry, Most people that are involved in ministry, they hope that their labor in the Lord is not in vain. 
They, they want to know that what they are doing counts for something. And I think that raises the question, how, how do we know whether or not our labor is in vain? What, what's the, what is the standard of measurement to determine whether or not I have obeyed God, whether or not I have been faithful in ministry, if I have es- executed what the Lord has given me to do. Something similar is taking place here as Paul recounts for the Thessalonians his initial ministry among them. And then Paul states that his ministry among them was not in vain. So that that sparks our interest, doesn't it? Because we say, okay, if I need to know or if there, what standard of measurement do I measure whether or not what I am doing for Jesus counts? Uh, Paul is about to say that his ministry is not in vain. What does he recount? How did he know that his ministry was not in vain? How did the Thessalonians know that Paul's ministry was not in vain? Why was Paul so confident in this initial ministry to the Thessalonians, that it was not in vain. How did he measure it? Well, let's look and see, because you'll see as we move along here, and you may have noticed it in in the beginning, that this is Paul recounting or giving reasons why he knew his ministry was not in vain. But there's something first that I want us to make sure of when when we begin this sermon And that is what Paul meant by not in vain. The word for vain there in the the Greek is K-E-N-E. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Kene. Meaning, but it means empty. So our our ministry, Paul is saying, was not empty. It was not in vain. But I don't think that we can contrast Paul's ministry not being in vain or not being empty in Thessalonica to it being full because I I don't think that Paul would say that his ministry in Thessalonica was the fullest it could have been. Uh, They were persecuted and run out early, right? I mean, there was, I'm certain, more that Paul desired to say, more that Paul desired to do But as we saw in Acts 17, 1 through 9, as Dale laid that out for us, they were unable to do everything that they had desired to do because uh, because their ministry was cut short. We also see that uh, in chapter 3, we're going to see that Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica uh, to exhort them and establish them more so, so they would not be tempted. And so Paul recognizes that It was not full to completion that the ministry in Thessalonica was was not empty, but it was not full to completion. But even though it wasn't full to completion, I think that all of us can agree that it did have a, a measure of fullness. Paul's ministry had a measure of fullness. And so just in an attempt to, uh, uh, provide clarity, but somewhere between, Empty and full, I've chosen the word substantive to describe Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians. It was not as full as it could have been, but it certainly was not empty. It was a substantive ministry. <clears throat> it was not in vain. It, was, it had substance. And so what makes Paul so certain his ministry to the Thessalonians was not in vain or it had substance What are the characteristics of this substantive ministry? And that's what I want to speak about. I find two here, characteristics of a substantive ministry. So first, Paul says the ministry in Thessalonica was substantive in verses 2 through 6 because it was a bold proclamation of the gospel in the midst of conflict. So what's a characteristic of A substantive ministry, a substantive ministry is a bold proclamation of the gospel amid conflict. Bless you. I feel your pain. 
Paul recalls uh, how they were treated in Philippi, opening up. You remember how we were done wrong in Philippi just to their arrival in Thessalonica? That's recorded in Acts 16. And then, as I've already said, Dell laid out for us uh, how they were treated in uh, Thessalonica in Acts 17. But in spite of the suffering and shame they received at the hands of the Philippians and at the hand of those Thessalonians, Paul said we preach the gospel with boldness. But verse 2 says that this boldness did not arise from the strength of Paul. This was not Paul pulling up his bootstraps and saying, well, you mistreat me, here it comes, baby. I'm fixing to give you the gospel. <laughs> That's not the way. He didn't do it in his own strength. Rather, Paul recognizes the strength came from God. It was a strength from God. The boldness was not in Paul, verse 2 says. The boldness was in God. The NIV actually translates in our God as with the help of God. So Paul is conveying that the boldness that came to them did not arise from their own strength, but it came to them because God was helping them. And I think maybe even that gives us a hint of what is behind the substantive ministry. It is the help of the Lord. But they had a boldness in God, but <clears throat> Paul then goes on to say that they had a boldness in the message. Verse 3 opens with the word for or because, for our appeal does not spring from error. And what this is doing is it connects their boldness in declaring the gospel in verse 2 with the reason he is about to give in verse 3. And Paul says that they were able to declare the gospel with boldness for or because their appeal does not spring from error, impurity, or deception. Paul had boldness then in the message. He had boldness in the purity of the message they were preaching. Well, what is the message they were preaching? Paul sums it up for us. In Acts, I'm sorry, Luke sums it up for us in Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 2 and 3 if you have your Bible. I apologize, I didn't get that on the screen. <clears throat> Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from Scriptures. And here's the message that he was preaching from Scriptures. Explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. This is the summary. Paul was reasoning in the synagogues that the Old Testament scriptures taught that their Messiah would suffer on the cross and be raised from the dead. And then Paul says, look, Jesus of Nazareth was that Messiah. He is the one that was crucified. He is the one that was raised from the dead. So Paul was preaching that Jesus came to die for sinners, that he was raised from the dead, and then he was calling people to believe on Jesus. This gospel appeal, it didn't arise from error or delusion. It didn't spring from any impurity or impure, immoral motives. They were not trying to, Paul and Silas or Paul and company were not trying to trick the Thessalonians like an angler baiting the fish hook, which is actually the word picture here in the Greek. Instead, Paul and company preached with boldness because they knew for certain that Jesus of Nazareth was the prophesied Messiah and he came and died for sinners and rose from the grave by the power of God. Paul is saying, look, I, can, I was so bold with you because what I was saying is true. I didn't embellish it. I didn't add to it. I didn't try to make some emotional appeal or as he's going to say in a moment, I didn't use flattering words. We were bold because what we knew was just a recount 
of how things actually happen. Jesus of Nazareth died for sinners, was raised from the grave, and then he called people to repent and believe this sure word. The surety of this message gave them boldness, even in the middle of great conflict. And may I tell you, unbelieving friend, if you are here today, or if you are hearing me via Facebook Live, I want to say that we are just as bold to declare this today because we are just as convinced as Paul and Silas were 2,000 years ago. Further, we, equally, we are equally bold to call you to believe this message of salvation to the salvation of your soul. Jesus Christ died for sinners. He was raised from the dead, and we call you to believe. An unbelieving friend, if you reject the message, tragically, it will be to the damnation of your soul. So Paul had boldness in God. He had boldness in the message. And as I've already alluded to, Paul had boldness in pure motives. We were bold by the help of God because we had pure motives. The message was pure, but our hearts were pure. Another source of Paul's boldness in proclaiming the gospel is that he did it with a pure heart. Their, mo- their motives were pure Towards God, as it relates to God, I should say in verse 4, the ultimate and purest motive is that they did not preach to please men. We had boldness, our motives were pure because we were not preaching for the applause of men. We were not preaching to please men, but rather we were preaching to please God. They were... They were there to proclaim the gospel. And they were there to do so ultimately for the pleasure and glory of God. Regardless of how the people responded, you may get angry. You may reject the message. No one may believe. But we're not here for your applause. And we're not here for your response. We're here to please God. And, and my prayer is, even as, I, even as I studied this sermon, I actually wrote it down in my notes with exclamation point, God, give us more men of that sort. Make me a man of that sort. We, listen, I understand that when we are reaching and preaching and hoping and pulling for the souls of men, naturally, we want them to respond positively. Isn't that correct? It, it breaks our hearts when we share the gospel and it seems like it falls on deaf ears. That, that, is, that, is a, that is a heartbreak to us. But listen, we do not share the gospel simply because we think or don't think folks respond. The reason that we preach, the reason that we proclaim, the reason that we believe and that we do the things that we do is because we have a desire to please the Lord regardless of how others respond to the message. And we've got to remember that. We've got to remember that. I've got to remember that. But their motives were not only pure as it relates to God, but Their motives were pure as it relates to the message. Verse 5 tells us that. And then note how verse 5 correlates with verse 3. For we never came with words of flattery. This is verse 5. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. But then verse 3, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. They did not come with flattering words, nor was there a need to do so because their message was true. No error. It was pure. No immoral motives and no impurities. And it was honest. There was no deception or deceptive tactics. They didn't have to use it because they knew what they were saying was true. And then Paul says, we didn't come with a pretext for greed. And again, 
the NIV perhaps makes it clear here and says, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. We weren't trying to proclaim something extraordinary to you as a way to mask over a desire for greed. I think that this is probably an illusion. There were a lot of kind of traveling philosophers in the Greek world, and they would come with these uh, magnificent speeches uh, and flattery, and it was just a a very uh, rosy oration. And then they would take collections up, and the people would be so worked up over the extraordinary speech that they that they would pay these orators money or these philosophers money. And uh, from, from what I understand in, in the historical context of this, that some of these guys made a good living doing that way. And maybe even because Paul came and company came dis- declaring this extraordinary thing that Jesus Christ died for sinners and was raised from the dead, that this was just them trying to mask their desire for for money, and, and Paul's saying, "No, we weren't. We were not trying to mask or cover up greed. We were telling you the truth. We were so bold with you, and we didn't. And we didn't. And we said it so straightforwardly. Maybe I should say it like that, because we knew we were telling you the truth. It wasn't because we were trying to get rich. And then Paul says, we made this obvious because <laughs> we were." working while we were doing this so we wouldn't be a financial burden to anyone. He says that in verse 9, doesn't he? So they were not preaching for payment, even though it does seem like it may have, uh, Paul may have been saying with his, rights, with his rights of apostleship that they could have sought payment, maybe even demanded support from the Thessalonians, but that's not what they were there to do. Rather, they were preaching the gospel to declare the truth about Jesus so all may hear and believe. We had pure motives. Their message was true. Their motives were pure. And this is a ground for boldness without a doubt. Further, their motives were not only pure as it relates to God and as it relates to the message, but their motives were also pure, verse 6 tells us, as it relates to the people. They did not preach so the people would glorify them in their great speech and rhetoric. That was another way that the Greek philosophers received payment. Not just money, but they received, they received payment by the fame and glory that came. The applause of men as they preached, or rather uh, as they declared these great orations. But that's not what Paul was doing. They were pure as it relates to the people. They were simply there to clearly proclaim the gospel message. Therefore, the words of flattery are unnecessary. Paul, as one unwielding apostolic authority, could have demanded his hearers pay him money, could have demanded that his hearers pay him attention, but he was not there to prove his apostleship. He was there to preach the gospel. And that is in, in spite of that constant conflict that Paul says that they were in the midst of. So a primary characteristic then of Paul's substantive ministry to the Thessalonians is that it was a bold declaration of the gospel despite great conflict. But there's another characteristic that I think is seen here of a substantive ministry. And that is... Paul says our ministry was not in vain because we care deeply for you. Our ministry ministry was not in vain because we boldly declared the gospel to you. But our ministry was not in vain because we loved you so much. So another characteristic of a substantive ministry is affectionate care for the Thessalonians. Perhaps no other word in the text communicates Paul's affection for the Thessalonians like the word that appears in verse 7, gentle. And I think that it captures this because of the, of the way that it contrasts the boldness that he has just been speaking of. Because 
because Paul was as bold as any apostle. But then he also says that he is as gentle as a nurturing mother. Uh, something came to mind when I, when I read this. And I was looking at this, and that is one time I was walking through the woods, and when I, I heard some beating through the palmetto bushes, and I looked over, and I saw a mama and two cubs, black bear. Uh, I don't know, 50, 50 yards from me. I was bow hunting. I did not have a gun. And I was <coughs> frightened. <laughs> because had, because the, the, mama, the mama was actually a little ways in front of, or as she turned to run behind, the cubs. And I was walking down the road, and, I, and if I would have timed it right, she would have crossed the road and the cubs would have still been on the other side of the road and I would have been in between mama bear and the cubs. And that's why I was frightened. Right? And it made me think of that. It made me think of this mama black bear because nothing is more frightening than a mama bear defending her cubs. I mean, there's a whole t-shirt industry and bumper sticker industry that uh, operates on that uh, illustration. But at the same time, if you've ever watched National Geographic or anything like that, nothing is more enduring and in, endearing rather and, and precious as seeing a, a mama bear having a tumble in the tall grass with her, with her cubs, right? She's playing and one nips on her ankle and she turns around and kind of gives it a little scold and then she uh, scoops up the bear you've seen the picture and throws it on her back and they go strolling through the meadow and it's so endearing and everybody is saying oh look how much she cares for those cubs but don't get between her and those cubs she's bold and gentle and that doesn't capture all of the contrast here but but maybe a little bit because i can just see in my mind's eye, Paul standing in the synagogues and with his sleeves rolled up maybe and his eyebrows furled and his nostrils flared as he is boldlessly and fearlessly defending the faith against the naysayers and unbelievers. We boldly declared the gospel to you. We knew it was going to create conflict. We knew perhaps it would mean imprisonment like it did in Philippi. But we did it anyway because we knew what we were saying is true. But then at the same time, see the same apostle who may have been so boisterous and clear in the synagogue, lovingly scoop up the weakest of the Thessalonian believers into a loving embrace and nourish him with the salve of the gospel of grace. Paul not only boldly declared the gospel in the face of much conflict, but he affectionately gave himself for the nurture of the Thessalonian spiritual maturity. And I've, for the sake of structure, I've categorized this affectionate care that Paul and company showed to the Thessalonians as loving, verse 8, giving, verse 8 and 9, living, verse 10, and teaching. So loving, giving, living, and teaching. Loving, Paul says in verse 8, we were affectionately desirous of you because you had become very dear to us. And it is a beautiful thing when God does that in the heart of a minister. As, as I feel that he has done that with me toward you. It is, not, it is not difficult for me to love you. It's not difficult for me to preach the truth to you. It's not difficult for me to attempt to be a part of your life, not because it's my pastoral duty, but because you've become very dear to me. And the Lord had, had done this. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. He had done this in the heart of the Apostle Paul with the Thessalonians almost immediately because Paul was not in Thessalonica for very long, maybe just a few months. And at the very least, just a couple of weeks. So why did Paul then declare the gospel in the face of much conflict? Verse 4, Paul says, because he loved God and desired to please Him. Why did Paul share the gospel in his own self with the Thessalonians? Verse 8 says, because he loved them and they were 
dear to him. So Paul declared the gospel because he loved God and because he loved others. On these two commandments, Jesus says, depend all the law and prophets. Paul's love for God and resulting love for the truth of the gospel flowed out into love for those to whom he preached. And this is the way it works, beloved. And I think that we can find a point of application here, can't we? Do I love the Lord and do I love others? And they are inseparably, or they are inseparable. If you are not loving others as you should, it very much has to do with the fact that you are not loving the Lord as you should. Because if you love the Lord as you should, you will love others as you should. There's an immediate correlation. This is, this is the two, the, on these two commands depend all the law and prophets. The more we know and love God, the more we will love and serve others. You may serve others without loving God. I'll grant you that. But it is impossible to love God without loving and serving others. But I think we need to notice also the act of love that Paul mentions here. Paul says we were so affectionately desirous towards you that we shared the gospel with you. I, I hope that you're beginning to see how gospel focused Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians were. Is. For, for how could Paul claim to love anyone and yet withhold the gospel from them? And here again, I think we can find another point of application. It is, so it is with us. We cannot say that we love the unbeliever if we refuse to share the gospel with them. And listen, we need to live before them to be sure. But the gospel is a message. It requires words. Use your words, right? Now I sound like a nurturing mother. The gospel is a message. Don't think that you can just live before I have some highly moral f- friends. They may even, by this world's standards, compare, say that they are more moral than I am. Right? But they are unbelievers, and they will tell you that they are unbelievers, that they do not believe in God, and therefore they do not believe the gospel. They don't believe that Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the grave. They're moral people. So... There's a shining example of how to live a moral lifestyle. But the reason that it has no gospel impact is because the gospel is not just a lifestyle. The gospel is a message. You cannot share the message of the gospel without words. Share the gospel, beloved. Don't excuse yourself by saying, well, I'll just I'll just live right. Because there are people in the world that live right that don't even believe the gospel. You need to give them the reason that you live right. Otherwise, it's legalism. So Paul was loving and he shared the gospel with them, but he was also giving. We were ready to share even our own lives, our own selves. He demonstrated his affection by sharing the gospel and sharing his self. And and then he shows what that looked like for him in verse 9. Paul said that they labored night and day so they wouldn't be a burden to the Thessalonians. More than likely what Paul is referencing is that he employed his tent making skills while in Thessalonica so he could earn a living while he was there. All the while ministering in the synagogues and elsewhere when he wasn't working. So he was probably ministering in the synagogues and in the uh, streets in the daytime and then laboring in the evening and nighttime. Not leaving probably a lot of time for rest and recreation. And, I, and again, I think of this, this nurturing mother picture that he says. A, a, a nursing mother, even though she has labored all day with her various chores... When she hears the whimper of her child in the wee hours of the morning, she rises in the middle of the night to soothe and to nurture her child. And so Paul and company is saying, like a nurturing mother, we labored for you day and night, and not because we only felt obligated, but because we loved you. The mother, when she scoops her child up, she isn't like, well, all the time, why don't you just be quiet and sleep all night? 
Sometimes it's like that. I get it. But she loving, even if she does feel that way, she doesn't just immediately demonstrate that. She, and, and the reason that she does that as a nurturing mother is because she loves the child. She's gentle and kind, even though she has been deeply and greatly inconvenienced. And so Paul is. But don't lose sight of how gospel focused again Paul is. He said he was giving himself to the Thessalonians day and night. But look at the end of verse 9. We work day and night that we might not be a burden to, uh, to any of you while we did what? Proclaim to you the gospel of God. It was still the gospel that was the nourishment. Paul, was, Paul knew that the true nourishment the young Thessalonian church needed was the milk and meat of the word of God. We labored and gave ourselves so that we could nourish you with the word of the, of, of the Lord. I need to move on quickly. Paul further demonstrates his love for the Thessalonians by living holy righteous and blameless lives before them he wants to set an example before the thessalonians he doesn't just simply preach to them but he gives them an example on how to live it out and there are some distinctions in the words holy righteous and blameless but i don't i don't think that there's so much distinction that we can make much of it but it is worthy to notice that the word Holy here is not that common Greek word hagios, which is to set apart, but it's actually hosios or hosios, which actually means pious and devout. And so Paul is not meant, he is not talking about uh, uh, positional holiness. He is actually talking about a lifestyle. We lived holy before you, or we lived piously and devout lives. He's an example of piety is what he is saying to the Thessalonians. So living righteously could be Paul setting the example of how, that, uh, how they should live towards one another. Being blameless. Maybe uh, speaking of Paul's reputation, we were blameless before you. People are attacking our reputation, but it's without cause. Paul is not willing... The ultimate thing, I think, though, we need to see is that Paul is not willing to instruct the Thessalonians how to live out their faith without also setting an example for them. We told you how to live. And we showed you how to live. And finally, teaching, verses 11 and 12. And this is, Paul swaps metaphors here, but he still stays within the bounds of that parental idea moving from a nurturing mother to an instructive father. He shows his affection for the Thessalonians by demonstrating those tender motherly qualities, but he also shows his affection by showing those instructive fatherly qualities to them. Teaching is the main one that Paul has in view. He shows his affection by exhorting and encouraging them to live in a way that reflects their calling by God. All the way back in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul says that they knew the Thessalonian believers were chosen by God because the gospel came to them with the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And they responded by receiving the word with the joy, uh, with the word with joy of the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of affliction. So Paul is saying, we know you were chosen by God because we preached. And even though you were in the midst of affliction, you responded joyfully. The word of God and the Holy Spirit worked to convict your heart. And because of that, we know that the Lord has chosen you, that the Lord has saved you. Now, now Paul is saying that like a father teaches his children, we labored to teach how they should live out that calling or that choosing or that salvation. Live it out in a manner worthy of the one who called you. And this is the way that it always works. The theological way of describing this is that the indicative always precedes the imperative. What is true about what God has done for you Always comes before what you ought to do. Right? 
And again, I don't need to hurry, but this is something that must be drilled. If you ever start talking about what you need to do, what you need to do, what you need to do, it quickly moves into legalism. If we, if what we need to do is not immediately and primarily, firstly connected to what Christ has done for us, it slides immediately into the slope of legalism. It's not about what you need to do, about what you need to do, about what you need to do. It's about what Christ has done for us. He has borne God's wrath on Himself. And in response to that, we live as others have lived, righteously, holy, doing good works. And we've got to get that right because if we don't get that right, we don't have the gospel, we have morality. What Matt Chandler called therapeutic moralistic deism. The indicative always precedes the imperative. Yes, there are things that Paul will instruct them to do. But first he says, I need you to know that you are chosen by God. You believe the word of God. And then we showed you how to live in response to that. We've we've got to get this. And then finally, Paul says that God is the one that called the Thessalonians into his kingdom and glory. Paul always taught the kingdom of God had had a present manifestation and a future glory. This is, you remember, some of you probably remember Dale talking about the already not yet nature, the kingdom that we would deal with quite a bit in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians. And here it is again. And and this could even well be a hint of what Paul will teach them later on in the letter. Here Paul likely reminds them that like a father, he taught them to live worthy of their dignity as citizens of the kingdom and worthy of their destinies in the future glory with God. And so as Paul surveys his initial ministry with the Thessalonians, he can say with confidence that he had a substantive ministry with them. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was substantive because the gospel was preached with boldness and clarity. And affection was shown in nurturing and teaching the Thessalonians to live out their calling in a worthy manner or a manner worthy of their present citizenship and future destiny in the kingdom of God. And I, and I think and I, I think that I've kind of maybe even belabored this, but I, the, I think there's an application here. Because every true Christian desires to have some sort of substantive ministry in the sphere of life where God has called them, right? We, we don't want our service for the Lord to be in vain. We don't want, as the, uh, as the biblical illustration is, we don't want all of the works that we have done to be straw and to be burn up on the day of judgment. All we, what we want to do is to say that what I have taken to do for Jesus had some substance. And that's why I began with the illustration of, of my reflection on ministry. The question is, how do I know if I have done what I've done for Jesus is in vain or not? What is the standard of measurement for a substantive ministry or one that is in vain? And I think this message challenges the typical mindset of Western thought or those that have been influenced by it. That that pragmatic idea of, of measurement. It's substantive Because it was successful. It's substantive because it was associated with crowds or numbers. And I don't don't think that Paul could say that here. At least least he never alludes to the amount of people that were saved in Thessalonians. In Thessalonica, rather. He, he, He never... He never says we, our ministry was not in vain because so many of you believed. Or, or our ministry was not in vain because we saw a 
great discipleship ministry began in the seat of Thessalonica. Nowhere, nowhere does he say that. Rather, he says our ministry was not. We know that we had a substantive ministry and you know we had a substantive ministry. Because we do, we boldly declared the gospel. We preached the gospel and we loved you. That's that's how that's how we know, beloved, we don't need to fall into this pragmatic trap of asking how many or how much, but rather ask what kind we measure the substance of what we do for Jesus by asking, am I bold in? Am I faithful to the gospel even when opposed? Do I minister gently and selflessly? selflessly, Or do I minister greedily and to please people? Am I an example to those that I, to whom I ministered? Or if they knew what I did in private, would it be completely discounted? Do I exhort them to live in a way that pleases God? Or do I, in the name of Christian liberty, tell them that it doesn't matter how they live? This is the true standard of substantive ministry. Listen, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 6, where one waters, one plants, but God gives the increase. God is looking for faithfulness much more than he is looking for success. And, and I... There's something else here that I, that I thought immediately may apply to our context, if you'll allow me some liberty. You know, church on the way at this moment is, seems to be in a somewhat of a season of loss. In just the last couple of weeks, we have lost two people who were actively connected to our church, Right? And, and there are those among us whose hearts are deeply grieved. And then there are those as we move out uh, who are less and left, less grieved, but still afflicted in heart nonetheless. And I'm not comparing the, the way things happen in life with the, suf- the suffering and persecution that Paul faced in Philippi and Thessalonica. But I think all of us can say that to some degree or or another, especially over the last couple of weeks, we have suffered affliction. And then take into account some of the things that God appears to be doing across the country. And we are very hopeful that this is that this is these are genuine moves of the spirit that will result in in a work of God. Uh, across across the country and around the world, right? Our hearts are hoping that. We, I know and understand we need to test and uh, discern uh, everything, but some of the things that are happening in uh, Asbury and and some of the other things, and we're looking at these things, and you're like, man, wouldn't it wouldn't it be nice if church on the way lingered around and prayed and sang uh, songs, and wouldn't wouldn't that be wonderful? And, but then we start comparing, but we're in a moment of affliction. Our hearts are sad. And we're not seeing these these great things like others may be seeing. Is what we're doing, does it even matter in Lake City? Are we making an impact? Well, let's stop measuring ourselves by what may or may not be happening elsewhere. And measure ourselves by the standard of a substantive ministry. Is what we're doing making an impact in Lake City? Well... Are we boldly declaring the gospel? And are we loving and serving others? And we can say with Paul, our ministry among you, Lake Sidians, was not in vain. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for calling us Thank you for comforting us in affliction. I I, I cannot get past, Lord, that there are those among us who may be hearing by Facebook because they are uncomfortable with coming because they might cry too much. I can't can't ignore the fact that there there are those that are part of this local body who are hurting. And when they hurt, we hurt. I pray for your comfort, Lord, and I thank you for your comfort. But I also pray, Lord, in the midst of this affliction, that we would continue to be faithful to you. 
Lord, I pray, God, that as we recount our lives and our ministries and whatever you have called us to do in whatever sphere, that we don't get wrapped up in this worldly idea of measuring ourselves with others or measuring ourselves with the standards of success, the arbitrary standards of success that the world has come up with. But rather, we measure ourselves by your word. And Lord, when we measure ourselves by your word and we rest in the gospel, we are certain, Lord, that we can be faithful in ministering and doing what you have called us to do, that we won't be discouraged in the rise and fall of success and failure. But we'll be encouraged and bold, emboldened in you. Make it a reality in our lives. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.